Today we're going to take a look at the materials we need for lab three and this is the lab there where we cover the lower vascular plants. These are the vascular plants that do not produce seeds. So these are the ferns and their allies. So let's get started. So we're looking at tracheophytes. Trachea means tube. And it phyte is plant, of course. These, so these are the vascular plants. In these plants, the sporophyte is dominant. The sporophyte is the part of the plant that is diploid, 2N. It's dominant and it's independent. Independent means that, or another way of saying that, is free living. That is, it grows independently of any other organism. It grows in the soil, for instance. Now, actually, in the plants we're going to do today, we're going to see that the sporophyte is free-living, but the gametophyte is also free-living, and that's not the case in all of the plants. But in all trachophytes, in all vascular plants, the sporophyte is free-living. There's supportive tissue in these plants, and that supportive tissue has is um, supportive because there are lignified cell walls. We'll talk about the secondary cell walls and what lignin is in just a minute. There's basically two kinds of cells that are supportive tissue and that is first of all sclerenchyma and also wood which can contain sclerenchyma but is also xylem. And the word xylem in fact is the Greek word for wood. Let's go back to sclerenchyma Sclera means hard, and incoma means an infusion. So these are cells. All of these cells, the sclerenchyma and the xylem, are dead at functional maturity. So when the cells are functioning, they have, they have died. The extant vascular plants have roots and shoots. We've seen some of those already in the terminology lab. Um, all, some of the non-extant plants, the extinct plants, uh, do not have roots. So here's our sporophytes. Everything you see on this page is a sporophyte. Everything you pretty much see when you go out into the nature and look out over the broad array of plants, those are sporophytes. You rarely see gametophytes unless you go looking for them, and then you really only see them in nature, where they're as kind of large, free-living gametophytes in these lower vascular plants, which is mainly what we're going to talk about today. In the higher plants, the flowering plants, there are gametophytes, but they're hidden down within the sporophyte kind of like our gonads are hidden down within our body, or our sperm cells and egg cells are hidden down within our body. So we need to take a look at the life cycles of these plants and see where the sporophytes are, or review where the sporophytes are, and see the difference between two types of life cycles we're going to see today. The first of those life cycles is called a homosporous life cycle. Homo means same, and spore means seed, and it's literally meaning seed, but we can think of it as just a spore, so same spore or same seed, here meaning that there's going to be one type of spore. So you recall that in our life cycle, the way that we're looking at life cycles, we're going to draw meiosis over here, and fertilization over here on the line, this part of the line. So below the line, everything is going to be diploid. And above the line, everything is going to be haploid. And those spores then arise from meiosis. And there's only one type of them. We're just going to work, write the word spores once. Kind of analogous to the spores over on the fertilization side, we have the zygote 
which is the diploid unicellular part of the life cycle. So let's follow around from the zygote. That zygote is going to grow by mitosis, mitotic cell divisions, and produce a sporophyte. The sporophyte, as part of its body, is going to have boxes that bear the spores, and those are called spore boxes, sporangia. I'm just going to write that singular sporangium. And within the sporangium is where meiosis occurs to produce our spores. Those spores go through mitotic cell divisions to produce multicellular organisms called the gametophytes. And those gametophytes now, there's only one type of them in this life cycle, those gametophytes produce boxes that contain the sperm and the egg. So I'm going to write egg up here first and sperm and we know those are going to unite in fertilization and the boxes are for the egg the archegonium and for the sperm the antheridium. And we'll see those terms, antheridium and archegonium, again and again. So that's the homosporous life cycle. Now there's one other type of life cycle we're going to see today, and that is the uh, heterosporous life cycle. Hetero means different. And spore, we can just think of it as spores now, it's easier. So different spores. So in other words, there's going to be two types of spores. And so we're going to have to differentiate those spores. Let's again with start with our horizontal line with the diploid portion below and the haploid portion above. Meiosis over here on the left. Fertilization here. Fertilization produces a zygote. The zygote grows by mitosis, mitotic cell divisions, into a sporophyte. The sporophyte produces some boxes that are going to um, are going to have the have meiosis take place in them. Now we have to change a little bit here because this sporophyte is going to produce two types of boxes. Let's go over and look at the process, what comes from meiosis to understand that. Remember we said there's going to be two types of spores. So there are going to be the female spores and the male spores. And as we follow this around, we're going to follow around then the results of producing these male spores and the female spores. And eventually the female spores, I'll put those on the outside, are going to come over here and produce the egg and the male are eventually going to come over here and produce the sperm which are going to unite in fertilization. So it turns out that these spores are different sizes. The female spores are a lot bigger than the ma male so we call those big spores, mega big spores. And the male spores which are very small are called microspores. The megaspores grow into the female gametophyte or the megagametophyte. Or the female gametophyte. The microspores grow into the microgametophyte. or the male gametophyte. Megagametophyte produces the archegonium.
which has the egg in it. Microgametophyte produces the antheridium. which have the sperm in it. Okay, with that basis, we have understanding what's going to happen slightly different down here in the diploid side. So we have two types of spores, so we're going to have two types of boxes, of spore boxes. So we're going to have a microsporangium, and a megasporangium. And those are going to be born on a single structure, which is called the strobilus. So the strobilus has these two types of sporangia on it. Let's kind of quickly sketch what a strobilus would look like here. So we get the idea. So we have a central axis of that strobilus. And then there are kind of leaf-like organs born on the side. Small leaves, really. They all look pretty much the same. And these are sporophylls. And then in the axles of those, we will find our sporangia. So I'm going to use a blue color for the boy sporangia here, the microsporangia. There they are. And in some of the other ones we find the female sporangia. I'm going to use a nice warm color for that. And there's the megasporangia. Okay, so they're just separated like that. Oftentimes in a single strobilus in some cases, there can be two stroboli, but really not in these lower plants. We're going to see this one strobilus. So that's the homo heterosporous life cycle. Here's how Simpson draws them. Unfortunately, Simpson draws them upside down. There was, in Simpson's first edition of his textbook, he had these ex drawn exactly the same way that we're drawing them in class. In fact, I produced lots of materials that had them drawn in the way that I've just drawn those two in this PowerPoint presentation just because I was following Simpson. He then came out with the second edition and he drew them all upside down. And I decided not to redraw all of my lecture notes and all of everything that I was producing on this to accommodate Simpson's crazy idea to switch everything around. Okay, so let's look at least what he did. So he's got meiosis over here on the right and fertilization over here on the left. But other than that, we've got the basic same basic idea. Here's meiosis producing our microspores and our megaspores. The megaspores produce the female gametophyte. There it is. The microspores produce the male gametophyte. There it is. You notice they're shown as quite small. There's our antheridium and our archegonium producing our egg and sperm, uniting in fertilization to form the zygote. Zygote grows in. They've got the embryo here, but it's going to grow into our sporophyte, sporophyte body. That's the major part of the plant. And that's going to have the microsporangium and the megasporangium on it. And for us in this class, we do not have to worry about the megasporocyte and the microsporocyte. These are the cells, the individual cells that are going to go through meiosis. And in some cases, they're important, but we're going to try to ignore them as much as we can for this class. Now, let's come back here and look at our gametophytes. Our gametophytes are really small, and you notice that they're kind of inside a wall there. They're inside a spore wall. So the gametophytes occur inside a spore wall. So inside the microspore wall or inside the megaspore wall. They are therefore called endo, inside, sporic, spore, endo, inside the spore, gametophytes.
And those types of gametophytes occur in these heterosporous life cycles. So this is a heterosporous life cycle. And in those life cycles, heterosporous ones, we have endosporic gametophytes inside the spore. And that's true of all extant plants. Okay, let's take a look at some of the plants we're going to do today. Most of the rest of the lecture is going to be spent going through the characteristics of these plants. First at a very high level, and then we're going to go through the characteristics of the individual um, taxa. So we're going to look at, first of all, this monophyletic group. Remember, a monophyletic group is one we can cut off our phylogeny in one cut. There's our weird-looking scissors making one cut, and we can see that this whole group here can be lifted off with that one cut. So that is a monophyletic group, the tracheophyta, or the vas we're just calling them the vascular plants. So the vascular plants. So what are the characteristics of the vascular plants? So that's what we've got down here. And we'll go through these pretty quickly with lignin as the first characteristic we're going to look at. Lignifid, lignin in secondary cell walls. Okay, so let's look at a cell. So here are two cells next to each other. We've taken a part of those cell walls and enlarged them down here in the lower one. So here is, this is one cell or one cell wall. And this is the cell wall of the adjacent cell. So two cells next to each other. There is a thin primary cell, what's called a primary cell wall here. I'll do it in yellow. There we are down there. That's primary cell wall. It's primary cell wall because it's the first one laid down. And then we have a secondary cell wall. Actually, I want to do the secondary cell wall in red here. So I'll kind of hash it in here. So that big, thick cell wall there is the secondary cell wall. And that's what we want to look at. We don't need to worry about too many of the other characteristics that are on this slide, but we do want to look at those, at least those two, primary and secondary cell wall. Remember the plasma membrane's on the inside of that, so the plasma membrane is on the inside of these cells here. That would be in that area, the plasma membrane around there. And here it is shown here. Okay, so the secondary cell walls are laid down second, and they have this character, this um, substance put in them, which I'm illustrating with the red there, which is called lignin. In other words, they're lignified. So lignin is added. And the lignin helps the secondary walls um, support the plant. It provides structural support. It, it kind of holds the cellulose together in a certain way. And it's very, very resistant to decay. So when you go out into the woods and you see a large branch or even a small branch laying there, and it may lay there for years, it is laying there and not decaying easily because of the lignin. The lignin is very resistant to decay. There's very few things that can break it down. Pretty much only the, um, the fungi can break down the lignin. So this characteristic of having lignified secondary cell walls is a uniquely derived feature of the tracheophytes, of the vascular plants. 
Now, if we look at a cross section, this is a cross section. It's x, x equals cross, so a cross section of a vascular bundle. of a vascular plant. And if we look at these red staining cells, this is why I've used red for lignin, these are all lignified cells. So this is a stain, lignin, it's a stain, a red stain that stains lignin. So lignin stains red. With this specific stain, it's called safranin, but the important thing is that you mainly see sections of plants stained with this stain, red stain, and what stains red are, are the lignified cells. There's different kinds of lignified cells here. We're not going to learn them all. Just say down here, this is xylem, which is the water conducting cell, and this up here are sclerenchyma. which are part of the structural cells for the plant. Okay, in fact, there's our second characteristic. We have sclerenchyma as a characteristic of all of these vascular plants. So we've seen what it looks like already a little bit. Let's talk about it a little more. A sl a sc sclerenchyma cells, sclerenchyma cells, they have secondary cell walls, so they have thick, secondary walls. And look down here again, the red is showing the secondary walls. Again, it's stained with that same reddish stain. And so this is the very small lumen. Lumen means that central um, cavity in the cell that used to contain the cytoplasm, but these cells are dead at maturity, dead at functional maturity. When they function in the plant, they're not living. And the lumen is very thin, and the secondary wall is very thick. Here's a cross section. And again, this is, that red is the lignified secondary wall there. Picture B here shows just some of these um, cells. There's, uh, these are fiber cells. They're supposed to be written out there, fiber. And fiber cells are long and thin. So you know that um, clothes used to almost exclusively be made out of either um, plant materials, linen, which is a fiber, really fibers from a plant, from the flax plant, or animal fibers, which are hairs, kind of hairs like from sheep. Could also be made out of cotton. Um, cotton is, a, is something a little slightly different. But flax are these fibers that are extremely long, and they're um, twisted together to make thread, and then the thread woven into fine linen clothing. And for many, many years, that's all we had. Here is a fiber cell in longitudinal section. I'm just going to say long section. So they're very, very long and thin with very thick walls. There's another kind of sclerenchyma. That last one was fibers. These ones are called sclerids, but the important thing for us is that this is just another type of sclerenchyma cell. And we see over here, they're isodiametric. Iso means the same diameter. So a, di a cell that's isodiametric is more or less spherical. So here's more or less spherical one. Here's several of the cells kind of together. There's really more than one cell there but they're kind of stuck together there. There can also be sclerids, which are H-shaped. Here's an H-shaped sclerid. And 
And of course, there's specific names for those kinds of slurs. Every shape has a specific name, and we're not going to learn them. We're just going to say, that in general, these are these sclerids. So the place you probably know sclerids from is eating a pear. You notice that um, when you eat a pear, there's kind of a little bit of a grit that catches, not because it catches in your teeth, but you can feel it grinding in your teeth a little bit. Those are sclerid cells. So um, pears are full of the sclerid cells. The wild pears, the progenitors of our existing pears, had a lot more sclerids in them, and they're almost certainly there as a deterrent to insects eating them. So that they are, these cells are so hard that they would abrade the insect's mandibles as they chewed on the fruit, and so, and so deter them from eating them. We've produced pears and other fruits that have many few, fewer sclerids in it. So even though you notice them there, there's not that many compared to the wild progenitors. So isodiametric cells with lots of very thick walls, again, and dead at function of maturity. As I've said already, here's our cross-section of our vascular bundle, and these are sclerids, our sclerenchyma. Specifically fibers. So we're seeing them in cross-section, but they are very long and thin and dead at maturity. Next, we have the vascular tissue, and we'll kind of do those together, the xylem and the phloem. And you can see here's phloem and xylem. And here we have the, what we're calling tracheary elements, which are the elements of the xylem. Trachea means tube. And you know that from our human anatomical trachea also, a tube. So these uh, cells are tubes. They can have different shapes as shown on the left. But they are all dead at maturity again. So the all So they more or less form tubes that allow water to be pulled up the plant. And the water is pulled up by transpiration that comes out the leaves. You can see again they stain red here, which means that they are dead at maturity. Actually, that second one there, that's a sclerid. But there is a vessel. So there's a one like that. There's one like that. Same kind of thing. One a drawing, one a photograph under the microscope. They have perforation plates, which just means holes in the ends of the end walls, and they are stuck, to, then the vessels are stuck together into long vessels. They're actually called vessel elements stuck together into long vessels. And again, here we have them down here. This is xylem. And I'm going to get some black to show you here, here, these are all vessels. There's a few other types of cells in there, but right now we're just concerned with those vessels. Okay, the sieve elements, this is the phloem. Phloem is the tissue, the sieve elements are the individual cells. They are living, but they're pretty weird. I'm going to say strange, but they're strange at maturity because they're strange because they're living, but they have no nucleus, they have no organelles. Um, they do have some. Uh, they do have some subcellular components, but no mitochondria or anything like that. So no real way to metabolize energy. They're dependent on other cells to provide them with energy, and they're just kind of conduits, living conduits for the transport of sugars.
So I've been assuming that you knew that the xylem was transporting waters and the phloem is transporting sugars. So these cells then are connected one to another through the sieve plates. There's actually cytoplasmic continuity between those little holes. It's not one big hole like in the xylem elements, but here in the sieve elements, it's um, little holes and the plasma lemma or the plasma membrane runs through those holes and connects each cell to each other. And the sugars can move then through these living cells. They move by active transport and the transport is up. So transport sugars and they go up. I'm sorry, they can go up or down. So they can do bi-directional transport. There's even evidence that the sing a single cell can move sugars in both directions at the same time. That's in contrast to the xylem, which moves water only upwards. Can't The cells are dead, no active transport, can't move water both directions. The phloem is here, in this area. And there are individual sieve cells in there. They're harder to pick out here. Again, there's multiple types of cells, but I'm going to get blue here. And some of these bigger cells here are certainly sieve cells within the phloem. OK, the root is also unique here and the endodermis, but we are not going to cover them in this class. They are, it would be the only thing we ever say about them, and so we're just not going to worry about the technical characteristics of the root and this endodermis, a special tissue within the root that helps the root transport materials or, well, if I'm not going to cover it, I'm really not going to cover it. So that completes as much of these characteristics as we're going to do. And now we're going to turn to our individual groups within the vascular plants. For today's work, we're just going to be considering this group here. And that may look like a lot, but this one branch over here has about 300,000 plants in it. So those are the um, seed plants, and we'll get to those later, although not all 300,000 of them. So we've really got a very few, a small group today. And we're going to start with these, what Simpson calls the lycopodiophyta, that's at the division level, or lycophytes, that's not an official name at all, or the lycopsida at the subclass level, or we're just going to really consider the families, the Selaginella ACE, the missed one over here, the Lycopodiaceae, and the Isoataceae. This one is extinct, and so we are not going to consider that in this class. Except to say, here's a picture of it. And I want to mention this because this is really a tree sized lycopod. The extant lycopods are very small, maybe, oh, a big one might be five inches tall. And uh, this is these are as tall as any tree you would see around Greensboro. So very, very large plants that produce no seeds at all, but just spores on them. So pretty cool plants. Some of them are in the, what we're burning in our gasoline now. They made up the coal deposits or the petroleum deposits. All of the lycopods today have really small leaves. Now Simpson calls these lycophils, but no one else calls them lycophils. So we're not going to use that term. We're going to use the term that everyone else besides Simpson uses here. We're going to call them microphils. Literally microphils means small leaf, but they're not just small leaves. The technical distinction between microphils and megaphils, so microphils in the Lycopodiaceae and its relatives, and megaphils in just about everything else, there are technical differences between them. This drawing here and this one over here are both microphils. And 
and they're showing this different, this first characteristic they want to put forward, first characteristics. So there's a singular vascular strand within the microfill. Only one vascular strand. And also, if you notice here, there's stem vasculature and there is leaf vasculature and there is no gap. Over here on the megafill side, we see a complex vascular system. Complex vascular system in the leaf. And here, there is a gap. A gap in the vascular system. where the leaf attaches to the stem. So that's the difference between microfills and megafills. It is not just a size difference, or not even really even a size difference at all, because there can be very large microfills and very small megafills. So microfills can sometimes be larger than megafills, but microfills always have a single vascular strand and they have no gap where the vascular of vasculature of the leaf attaches to the stem, whereas megafills have a complex vascular system in the leaf and there is a gap where the vascular system of the leaf attaches to the vascular system of the stem. The Lycopodiaceae. The Lycopodiaceae is one of our lower vascular plants. And when we look at the structure of the plant, we see that these plants are usually about 4 to 10 inches tall. They're separated into parts which are reproductive. And vegetative. They don't always look exactly like this, but they do usually have those two parts. Well, they always have those two parts. Here's a vegetative part of the plant from a different species, and we can see a couple things here. One, that the plant is dichotomously branched. D-I-C-H means to, and tomi means to cut. So dichotomous branching is branching that it takes place into two parts. That dichotomous branching can sometimes be equal. So if our branches came up and we had exactly equal branches each time, we would call that equal dichotomous. If the branches were unequal, as they are in this case, one shorter and one longer, that would be unequal dichotomous. So like a podium has dichotomous branching, but the branching is usually unequal, as we see up here. The two branches are slightly different in length. When we look at the leaves, we see that the leaves are very small. In fact, the leaves are called microfills. Literally means small leaf. But there are technical characteristics that make a life. But there are technical characteristics that make a leaf a microfill. So let's look at what those are. So when we look at a microfill, which some people call lycophils, but for our purposes, we're going to not call them lycophils because it's an unusual name for this. 
We're going to still stick with the more common designation for these leaves and call them microfills. And we're going to contrast them with megafills. Micro, again, literally means small leaf, and mega literally means big leaf. But what are the technical characteristics that separate these two types of leaves, microfills, from megafills? When we look at microfills, we see that they have a single vein. So there's that single vascular strand, also here. So they never have more than that. And they also have no gap in the vascular system where the leaf attaches. So here's our stem vascular system here. And when we go out into the leaf, when there's a vascular trace that runs out into the leaf, there is no gap here. So there is no gap in the vascular system. And again, we see that over here, the same thing. On a megafill, which is this other diagram, we see that the leaf vascular system is quite complex. There are multiple veins in the leaf. And there is a gap in the vascular system. See that here at the arrow. So those are the technical characteristics that distinguish a microfill from a me megafill. An important thing to remember is that the size of a leaf does not have anything to do with whether it's a microfill or a megafill. Microfills can be reasonably large and megafills can be extremely small. So these technical characters we've been talking about are what define megafills and microfills, not their size. It's also true that most of the vascular plants have megafills. Microfills are only restricted to a very few of the lower vascular plants. Plants like Lycopodium and their relatives. Okay, let's look at the structure of Lycopodium a little more. When we look at the plant itself, we see that there are vegetative regions. A vegetative region and a reproductive region. Sometimes they're well separated, like in this case, and in other times they're not so well separated, as we'll see in the next slide. In the reproductive region, we have these spikes of reproductive organs, and these are called stroboli. Stroboli is plural. If we wanted to refer to one of them, we would call it a strobilus. Now, if we looked at a strobilus in detail, we would see that there are leaf-like organs on it, and those are called sporophylls. Phil means leaf. Spore means seed, but these are seeds in the sense of reproductive organs. They are the spores that um, come from meiosis. So we can see an enlargement of these sporophylls over here. So here is a Sporophyll. That's been removed from a strobilus. And inside or on top of that sporophyll, we have a sporangium, and those are supposed to be dots. And that sporangium is full of spores.
and these are myospores, spores that are originated from meiosis. So a whole bunch of those are arranged together then into a strobilus, the reproductive structure of at least some of these lycopodiums. While there are other lycopodiums where the sporophylls are interspersed with the vegetative leaves. So in this region we have the sporophylls and down here we have vegetative leaves. And if we looked lower again we would see another region of sporophylls from earlier in the growth. In the axle of each sporophyll we find a sporangium. And we can see that perhaps even better on the left, there's the sporangium. In the axle of a sporophyll. On the next side, slide we see that again. Here's the sporophyll. Here's a sporangium, this one is open. Here are other sporangia over here, these ones over here on the left are closed, and again this is a sporophyll. So each of those sporangia contain the spores, the haploid spores, which are going to grow into the gametophytes. Well, there's two types of life cycles we have in the lower vascular plants. Those life cycles can either be homosporous or heterosporous. Let's look at the heterosporous one first. So in the heterosporous life cycle we have two types of spores. Here they are, they are called microspores and megaspores. And they grow into two types of gametophytes. The microspore growing into the male gametophyte and the megaspore growing into the female gametophyte. And then those gametophytes, female bearing the archegonium, the male bearing the antheridium, and the sex cells then are born in those structures. So we have those two types of spores here in the heterosporous life cycle. In the homosporous life cycle, we have a single kind of spore, single type of spore. That produces a single type of gametophyte, and that gametophyte then bears two types of sexual structures. It bears both the female and the male reproductive organs, which then bear the egg and the sperm. So one type of spore. Now the important thing to remember here for lycopodium and its relatives in the Lycopodiaceae is that they are not heterosporous, they are homosporous. So they bear one type of spore. And if you remember our last slide, we showed only one type of sporangia. If it was a heterosporous life cycle, there would have been two types of sporangia. So we see here in Lycopodium, we have vegetative stems which are branching and they're dichotomous, but the dichotomies are often unequal. The life cycle is homosporous. There are microphylls, those leaves with a single vein, and they are spirally arranged. There are sporophylls, and those sporophylls can be in strobily, or they can be born in clusters, clusters among sterile leaves. The gametophyte is exosporic. Now we haven't talked about that yet, but an exosporic gametophyte is one that grows outside the spore wall. And you're probably wondering, are there gametophytes that grow inside those really tiny spore walls? And yes, there are. In fact, most of the vascular plants have gametophytes 
which are really tiny and they grow inside the spore wall. But in Lycopodium and its relatives, and in some of the other lower vascular plants, the gametophyte is exosporic. Now it's also the case that all of the existing plants that are homosporous also have exosporic gametophytes. So if you can remember that exosporic always goes with homosporous, you only have one thing to remember about these plants. There are true roots present, and we'll see that is a contrast to some of other, the gr other groups where we do not have true roots present in these plants. How about our <clears throat> phylogeny? Well, we find our Lycopodiophyta, that would be a division level down here near the base of the tree. Most of the vascular plants are up here, and we would have to expand that branch very considerably so that we could see all of those vascular plants or see the phylogeny of those plants. Here's Lycopodium and its relatives in the Lycopodiaceae. We will also do other families, Selaginellaceae and Isoataceae. We will not do this family except for right in the next slide. We're going to look here at this next thing, which is an extent, extinct plant that is related to Lycopodium and its relatives. And I wanted to mention that because in the past, these lycopods, these plants that are like lycopodium, were tall trees. They weren't small, four to six inches, ten inches plants as like we have today, but they could get, you know, up to almost two meters across here at the base. So they are very large plants, and some of them have formed the coal deposits that we use today. Back to lycopodium. Here's our phylogeny of lycopodium. This is going to be the group, the Lycopodiaceae here. It's got several genera in it. We've only talked about one. Here is our outgroup here. This is the Isoataceae. And here is our monophyletic group of the Lyco Lycopodiaceae. So it is a monophyletic group. We can make one cut and remove that whole branch. The distribution of Lycopodium is shown on this slide. This distribution is not completely accurate, but it gives you an idea that it's basically worldwide except for regions like the regions of the desert, big desert regions. And this region up here, it probably does occur in Russia in those regions. It just hasn't been recorded very well from those regions. So approximate distribution, we should say, for this pattern. Now, Lycopodium has got some unusual features, and most of those unusual features are associated with its spores. These are the spores of Lycopodium, and it has a, these spores have a very high surface area. They've got all these little pockets in them. So these pockets can hold air if you were to submerge these spores. And they also give it a very high surface area, which gives it some other unique kinds of properties. So let's see what happens if you take lycopodium like powder. and you were to float it on water here, it doesn't wet very well because of all that surface area. It captures little pockets of air. And then you stick your hand down in it, and you see that powder just will coat your hand. That is, it's trying to get away from the water because it's got captured air in those pockets, and so it's really hydrophobic. Well, because of those air pockets also, it is really flammable. So if you were so inclined and you had a safe environment in the laboratory, you, I'm trying to make eyes at you here to show you that maybe it's not even safe for the laboratory. You could try this, and that is like a podium power exploding in flame in a laboratory. She's blowing air into a little pot of a lycopodium flower, which then hits a flame and explodes like that. And if you were even a little more crazy, you could let your kids try it at home in a Quaker Oats container, which, of course, everyone knows is not flammable. It is flammable. 
don't do this at home. These guys are completely nuts. Or if you're even maybe more nuts, although I don't know what can be more nuts than that, you can take some lycopodium powder and make a huge firewall outside of your completely inflammable trees and the side of your house. Notice that this guy has a <coughs> shirt with the element bullshitium on it, and perhaps that's appropriate. Well, that's our introduction to the Lycopodiaceae. Don't try any of those things at home. Silotaceae are another one of our lower vascular plant families. There are two genera in this family, as we'll learn. They're all very simple plants. They have green photosynthetic stems. And these stems are branched in a very unusual way. You can see it here. They are branched equally. So when they branch, they always branch equally like this. So this is equal dichotomous branching. So every time these plants branch, the two branches are equal in size. There are these stems then. They are spe there are special kinds of sporangia, which are called synangia, which we'll look at a bit later. And there are little tiny leaf-like organs. Here's one down here, and these are called enations. They are not really leaves. Let's look at these features a little more closely. So here you can see very clearly the dichotomous branching. And if we look at the stems, we will see the leaves. And here is one enlarged. They have no vascular system. So we really should not call them leaves. We should really refer to them by another name, and the name that is given to them is an enation. Enations. So little non-vascularized blips of tissue that occur on these photosynthetic stems. Here's our plants again with our synangia, dichotomous branching, and the inations. If we look closer at those <coughs> sporangia, we can see that our inations here beneath the sporangia are also dichotomously branched. And we can see that these sporangia have a special structure. If we look at it up here, we can see that there are actually three parts to the sporangium. So what we have are three fused sporangia. called a synangium. I-U-M is the singular ending. I-A would be the plural ending. Syn means worth and together. Angium means box. And the name is supposed to indicate that there are these three fused sporangia. If we look inside those sporangia, we see our spores. These are haploid spores that originated from meiosis. Here we see the same thing again. Here we see our one, two, three sporangia fused into a synangium. And if we were to look in section, we would see down here the same thing, three very clear fused 
sporangia fused into the synangium. And inside there, we have the spores. Our life cycle. Remember, we have two types of life cycles in the lower vascular plants. We have the heterosporous life cycle, where there are two types of spores. And we have the homosporous life cycle, where there is a single type of spore. I've, only, I've already shown you that there is one type of spore here, one type of sporangium. So we're pretty sure here, and we're correct, that this is not a heterosporous life cycle. The Silotaceae is homosporous. Here's a gametophyte. A drawing on the life and a photograph on the right. This is a haploid structure. It originated from the spores, and it bears the antheridium and the archegonium. The antheridium, the male reproductive organs, and the archegonium, the female. So this is a gametophyte of a homosporous life cycle. Notice that this gametophyte is growing outside of the spore wall. You don't see a spore wall here any place. And so this is an exosporic gametophyte. And in fact, all of the plants which are homosporous and are alive today have exosporic gametophytes. So here's our characteristics of the plant. The leaves, which are not true leaves now, they're, they're these enations, these non-vascularized blips of tissue. Silotaceae has these enations. There's dichotomous branching of the stems. The plant is homosporous, and the gametophyte is expo exosporic. The synangia consist of fused sporangia, and in fact, there are three of those. There are no true roots in these plants. So this is unlike the lycopods and other related plants. This has fungal roots. Like the root meaning of that is fungus, rise is roots. So mycorrhizae means fungus roots. So there are fungi that penetrate through the um, underground portions of the plant, and they extend out into the soil like roots would or root hairs would, and they help with absorption. There are two genera in the Silotaceae, Silotum and Mesipterus. The T is silent in this case. It's there, but it don't pronounce it, so you pronounce it as if it begins with an N, Mesipterus. And here they are. Here's two species of Silotum. There are only two species. This is the most common one, the one that we'll see in lab, Silotum nudum. And over here, you can see that the stems are a little more flattened. This is Silotum complementum. Mesipterus looks a little bit different, quite a bit different actually. This is Mesipterus. One of the things we can see here in these photographs are that there are synangia. In this case, the synangia consist of two fused sporangia, but still synangia. Here's our phylogeny. Here is the Silotaceae, and Silotales is the order. Silotaceae is the only family in the order, so this phylogeny only shows the order name here, but we could replace it with the name of the family. If we break that down and look at the phylogeny in more detail, we can find 
Silotum and Mesipterus here, and we can see they form a monophyletic group. You can take and cut them off and remove them with one cut, so the family is monophyletic. Looking at the distribution, we see that <clears throat> the thing that is most correct about this distribution is that it occurs in tropical areas. It's a, mostly a far eastern plant. In the United States, it really only occurs natively in Florida, so some of the distribution is off here. But it gives you an idea it's not a really widely distributed plant, mostly being found in the eastern parts of the world. When we look at Florida itself or in the United States, we see these dark air green areas, this is the areas where it is native. All the other places in the United States, if it occurs, it occurs because it's been introduced. Uh, there is possibly a native population over here in southern Arizona in this one county. Well, that's our introduction to this family, Silotaceae, a very interesting family and plants because of their lack of leaves.